good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kraken Agile Marketing. How are you all feeling today? Good, yeah? I know the second day of this conference is often return, referred to as fragile on the beach after the beach party, so I'll try and be gentle with you all. Um, so I'd really like to just find out who's in the room today before I get going. So can you put your hands up if you're in marketing? Cool. Two, three, four, that's about five, yay. Uh, can you put your hand up if you're a developer? Eight. And if you work in business? Cool. Is there anyone else in the room that doesn't do any of those things? What do you do? Scrum master, of course. Delivery manager? Perfect. That's great. It's nice to know who I'm talking to. Um, so feel free to tweet any questions to me throughout the presentation. It's on the slide that you can't see right now. Um, we're having, oh, it's back. We're having some technical issues with it dropping in and out. So hopefully you'll get the gist. But um, yes, my Twitter handle is at Lissa Crump. Hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. But if you tweet them to me or any feedback, I'll respond to you afterwards. Hitachi. Um, So I'll go to the next slide, even though you can't see it. Um, it's a GIF of someone saying, release the Kraken, just to give you an idea of what it is, because my talk is called Kraken Agile Marketing. Um, so I'm Lissa Crump, as my Twitter handle suggests, and I am the catalyst of disruptive innovation at Head Forwards. What on earth does that mean? Um, so I am head of marketing and involved with business development, recruitment, and team happiness. Oh, hey, John, thank you. This side like giving me trouble. <laughs> um, it's all right, we're just waiting patiently as people are coming in. It's not really technical difficulty. We're just uh, letting you come and take a seat before we carry on. <laughs> Amazing. Here is said gift. And I'll go back so it plays nicely for you. Thank you. Right, release the Kraken. We'll release it a second time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about my personal journey with Agile, um, including some of the mistakes as well as some of the wins. Um, hopefully you'll be inspired by my journey and you know, you can walk with some, away with some ideas on how to crack Agile marketing for yourselves. Spoiler alert, though, I love cephalopods. So they feature quite heavily in this talk. Um, did you know that cephalopods, so they're squids, cuttlefishes, octopuses, um, they are widely regarded as the most intelligent invertebrates, which I'm sure is something we can all relate to, being intelligent, not spineless. So I've spent many years in marketing and business development. I'm used to spinning plates and wearing many hats. But as I'm sure we all know, this can get stressful and really overwhelming. How do you prioritize when everything is a high priority? I started my Agile journey five years ago when I was sales and marketing manager at an e-commerce and manufacturing company. The company was growing really rapidly and I was managing many different departments, which was really challenging. Um, I have notoriously high standards. It's a pain for other people, but I do. So how do you make life easier while still being efficient and keeping up to your high standards? You adopt Agile. Yay! So at the beginning of my Agile journey, I was the only person in my company trying to adopt Agile. <laughs> yeah. The first thing I did was introduce a board. And I, honestly, at this time, I didn't even know the term Kanban. Um, my morning stand-ups were solo. Interestingly, squids are normally loners in the water too. Um, but luckily, my team started to grow quite quickly. And the Kanban board worked extremely well for us. Um, but I still couldn't get buy-in from the rest of the company. This is a common problem with Agile adoption, you know, not being able to get buy-in from the top, which is something that I really struggled with. However, even without this buy-in, Agile was still solving problems. There was visibility of the work being done. And I'm sure we've all worked with people that want to see every single thing that you're doing and proof of what's happening and just you know, know everything. Um, they want evidence of the work being done. 
adopting Agile can clearly show what you are doing, what has been done, and what you're about to do. So there's benefits in that. It also works when you're approached with the, mm, can you just tasks? Yes, I can do that, but what task from my board would you like me to drop so that I can do this task instead? That was a really valuable tool because it helped people realize that actually, you can't just magically find this time to do this urgent task. Something else that was planned has to, has to be shuffled down the backlog or the priority tree. Hmm. Adopting Agile really helped with my prioritization. It enabled me not to just go for those smaller, easier wins that you, you want to do because, hey, they're easier and you feel like you're ticking more things off you to do this. But it enabled me to tackle the big tasks. We would estimate tasks at this point. We'd give ourselves 100 hours for the month, uh, leaving some time over for emails and phone calls and all that kind of stuff. And we color-coded our tasks on our board to show which areas we were spending most of our time on. There's a really interesting story um, that I was told when I first started having some agile coaching about a company with a software development team and they were frustrated because they were doing the tech support for the whole business as well. So you're in the middle of creating some great code and you're working on some really cool, ah, oh, can you just come upstairs to floor 13 and fix the printer? That's really gonna help with your flow and your creativity. But the powers that be weren't really understanding of this as an issue. They're like, oh, it's fine, you know, you're here anyway. Why would we pay somebody else? So when they started doing the Kanban board, they color coded their tasks and say, uh, I, I don't know, colors, purple was their color for tech support and they'd marked down the hours, and then they showed it on the board. And um, eventually, the, you know, the powers that be saw this and saw how much time they were spending on tech support. And these are 40, 50, 60 grand a year developers. And think of adding up that time and money that was spent by them doing all this work. They realized that, hey, actually, for 20 grand, we can get tech support in, and we're saving all this money, and these guys are sticking to what we're paying them to do. So there's a really good example that I waffled for you all, so hopefully you got the point, about how color coding tasks can really help with the powers that be and yourselves to see where you're spending time and if it's the best place you can be spending time. In saying that, we still had so many last minute tasks that we had to deal with, but this, this cards and the board helped with the prioritization of the rest of it. Now, cephalopods, they only live for like one to two years. Even the giant Pacific octopus only has a lifespan of five years. So you think they've born out of these tiny little pearl-sized eggs and they grow to that size in two years. That is some rapid growth. And the company I was at during this time was doing the same thing. It was going from rapid growth right from conception. We were trying to learn fast and respond to the market. Um, and actually as a business, we were being incredibly agile even if the business didn't want to adopt that job or embrace the philosophy. So as I said, I was managing multiple departments at this time, which include the warehouse and manufacturing. So I thought, get them in on this uh, agile game. And we put up visual radiators in the warehouse. So we got the guys to just mark down when they were packing orders, as an example, like how many an hour, which could seem really big brovery and like, hey, we're checking up on you. But that wasn't the point. The point was to be able to have some data and analyze things and say, for an example, you'd be like, hey, Jim, you didn't pack anything between 11 and 12 today. What went on? Like, oh, we ran out of bubble wrap, so let's go down the road to Carter's and buy some. Like, that stuff shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't have to think about that sort of detail. They should be just able to focus on what they're doing, the task at hand. The same with developers, you know, they're working on code. They don't want to go, oh, we've run out of milk, I've got to go to the shop. Like, you want to facilitate them and give them the tools to succeed even if it is just making sure there's milk and bubble wrap. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting and great data that we found from doing that. You know, and the visual radiators enabled better communication between development departments, or departments, because there's no development. Um, so two years ago, I moved to a new company. I moved to Head Forwards. Look at all those happy faces. Um, so an explanation about this photo, we have just turned six but we'd won some awards this year. So we put on a big barbecue outside and we had some champagne at lunchtime. So yeah, everyone's very happy. <laughs> Sunshine and champagne, oh, work, winner. Um, but yeah, great crew. And um, they're actually a software company. So I've come to where software, um, where Agile actually originated from. So I was like, oh gosh, this is like the big deal now, not just me mucking around at a warehouse. 
It's a truly agile company, having embraced the philosophy as well as the tools and practices. And I learned about Scrum here. Who knows about Scrum? Cool. In Scrum, for those of you that don't know, you have sprint planning. So you plan the work for, say, like a two-week sprint, and you all agree the time and the tasks and what you're going to accomplish in that, in that sprint. Um, then nothing new is added to that sprint. If you work in sales and marketing or recruitment or business, you'll know that that is just not a possibility <laughs> of not adding anything new into the pipeline. Things get dropped in your lap that absolutely, positively must happen now. Yes, we plan strategic work and it's great for that, but many things come up that have to be done there and then. Surprise! Um, a last minute request has come in. Can you just record this soundbite for this podcast or give me views on this news article? That deadline's five minutes. An exaggeration, but not that much. <laughs> um, so how do you combat that? In joining Head Forwards, I was back to the solo stand-ups. Um, there were three people in my office, but we were all working quite separately from each other. Oh, did it play? Did you get to see someone right? Yeah, OK. I was just expecting a bigger laugh. <laughs> um, so yeah, Head Forwards has grown rapidly, though. And in 12 months, we've grown from 57 people to over 100. Yeah. Um, recruitment is all done in-house here, and it's become a large part of what I do. Um, and my team's grown recently, and I'm lucky to work with a great bunch of lunatics who share <laughs> my work. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and I can say that because they're in the room, so, um, you know, it's all right. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's been challenging trying to teach them about Agile, um, but it's been rewarding and fun. So how do I make Agile work for a business team at Headboards? Boards. Um, this is the board I was first using when I came to Head Forwards. Again, I was allocating 100 hours a month, which isn't something we do anymore. But at the time, that was that's what I know and that's what I did. Um, so here I'd have, I don't know if you can see it. So next quarter, next month, this month. Oh, no laser. Blocked, doing, and review. Um, again, they're color-coded. I'd put an hour limit on, so I think that was going to take 10 hours, and I'm doing that at the minute, etc. And the cards would move through. And I quite liked having the this quarter, next quarter, month thing, because, you know, marketing, you're thinking about long-term things, long-term goals, what I want to be doing in six months. Oh, this conference is coming up. I really need to submit something or think about sponsoring it. So it was quite good to give you a big, you know, pipeline view. As the team grew, the boards grew too and how we used it changed and evolved. And I'm really sorry for this dodgy picture. Turns out we don't really photograph our boards very often. And I was going through our archive trying to find some to uh, demonstrate and explain to you. And it turns out one of my colleagues took this creepy shot without me knowing. So <laughs> thanks, Jenny. I don't know why she's photographing me randomly in the office, but yeah. So this is the board we were doing. And on the left-hand column were our daily tasks on the outside, so you didn't forget that you had to do those things every day, like check your emails and you know, check the AdWords account. Then we went into swim lanes. Um, so you'd have a column, so that top row was me, and the next one was someone else, da -da 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 -da, and that's what you're planning to do this week. And then it would go into your doing done column. Um, the columns were, oh yeah, and then it goes into reviewed, and then blocked or on hold. You know, we wanted to work well together and not silo ourselves. We wanted to be more of a Venn diagram where we overlapped and we all could share, share the tasks and roles together. So we realized that after a while this wasn't working for us because we'd separated ourselves already <laughs> like before we even started pulling the work through. So um, we changed. When you're not siloed, you wear a number of hats. And, you know, it can be really important to keep track of those hats. So to make this easier, we color-coded our post-its again. Um, so green is marketing, orange is recruitment, blue is business development, and pink is admin. I mean, this isn't our board, but I just think it looks really cool. <laughs> um, but using color-coded cards wouldn't work well for cephalopods. You know, they, they can change color from their skin, but actually it turns out they're colorblind. And researchers have now realized that they have a gene um, that's normally found in the retina in their skin, so they can change colour to their surroundings without being able to see what colour it is. Madness. Um, so 
so we, as I said, we recently made some changes to our board. Um, so now, again, we've got the daily columns over here, so the things that we do every day. And then we split it into sections, so marketing, admin, office plan, finance, business development, and recruitment. And we put the cards in priority order, so they're all at the top, the most important, down to the least important. And this next section is what we're doing and what we're planning today do today, so work in progress. And then each of these columns is a person, so this would be myself and then my colleagues. The idea, and then again, blocked and on hold, and the done piles, which is where it starts to get a bit scrappy. Again, the lines aren't as neat as I'd like, but I was told I wasn't allowed to neaten them because I had to show you real life. Um, so the idea is that once you finish your day, you're pulling tasks from the top columns across the board. You look at which ones you can do, because there might be something in the top column of finance that I can't do, but I can do the recruitment task, so we work it like that. Um, in Scrum, again, this would just be the plan for the week or the sprint. In reality, in our roles, new cards get added daily. And sometimes they get added straight into your work in progress, sometimes into here, and sometimes into our further backlog. Um, it is important to try to minimize work in progress. I'm really guilty of trying to do everything at once that needs doing, but in reality, that's, that's just not possible. Um, so yeah, limit your work in progress <laughs> so you can focus on what you're trying to achieve. Again, more dodgy photos, but every morning we have a stand-up. Um, in our stand-ups, we say what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, and what we're blocked and stuck on. And quite often, we'll find there might be a single thing that's blocking us all on something. There might be one person from outside of our team that we really need feedback on certain things for before we can progress forward. So it's really interesting to analyze that and see what's happening and then find out what the reason is that we're being blocked by a person or on a certain task. Um, other people's tasks might actually change our prioritization for the day as well. It might be that uh, one of our clients is extending a contract, so we need to hire another four developers for them. So what will happen on that occasion is we'll all drop our tasks for that, what's going to be that day, and we'll work on writing a job advert and setting up AdWords accounts and creating graphics and doing a big recruitment push for the new four Python developers we need. Um, so yeah, being agile with what we plan for that day means we can achieve those things. Um, on Fridays, we pull down our dump pile and review each card to make sure that everything is done, done. Because you think you've finished the task and then you go back through it and you're like, oh, actually, I should probably follow up by doing this. So it really helps you miss those little things that might slip through the cracks by reviewing done. This is our backlog board. The tasks go on forever and ever and ever. So if anyone has a like, way of combating this, please come see me afterwards, because this is awful. Um, all our tasks are ranked, like must, should, would, and could. Um, so top priority in the right-hand corner, or right-hand side, to lower priority on the left. So the most important thing is that top right corner, least important bottom left corner, which obviously is the empty one. <sighs> Yay! <laughs> um, you know, the tasks on the, the board I just showed you, once those columns run out, they should be being pulled through from this board. So ideally from the top right through forwards. But as I mentioned before, Lots of new tasks get added, so things on this board end up being a bit stale. And sometimes you get to the point, you're like, if I've not done this in six months, is it going to happen? Is it worth happening? Maybe we should bin it. So backlog reviews were important. Where you mm. might think, oh, actually, this has been on here because it wasn't for six months, but now it's happening next week. I really need to do that. So backlog reviews are important. We've talked about moving to Trello. Does anyone use Trello in here? I love Trello. Oh, my god. I like things to be neat and organized and color coded and you put people's faces on it. Um, and I use it for a lot of other things. I use it for organizing things at home because I'm a giant nerd. So I like <laughs> um, or with software Cornwall, which I'm on the committee of. But we haven't moved to Trello yet in our team because speaking to some of the scrum masters that head forwards, they say if you can keep it physical, you should. This isn't the best gift for this. It's a let's get physical song, but it's the best one I could find, and I decided not to sing it instead as a backup, so you're welcome. We also have a separate board for recruitment. As I said, you know, recruitment's really a big deal for us at the moment, um, and for the whole two years I've worked there. We've never not been recruiting for more than one person in the two years I've been there. As I said, we've grown from 57 people to over 100 in the last 12 months. Um, 
And in the last six months, for every 61 applicants we get, we hire one person. So that's a lot of people that we're processing and dealing with for, for one hire. Um, on average, we get five applicants a day. So it's really important we're managing them properly. Um, again, we color code them. So teal is Python here, green is front end, purple is Perl. Um, so that really helps in a visibility way of, of who's coming in. Um, trying to manage all these applicants, even with recruitment CRM, can be really, really tricky. Um, this solution, the board, really helps. Um, help not let people slip through the cracks. Because we know how bad it can be when you're applying for a job and you think, yeah, I'm perfect for this, I'm really excited and I want it, and then nothing. It's soul crushing. And actually, it just seems a bit rude, so that's not how we do. We want to keep you up to date with what's happening and talk to you and touch contact. And, and we've got you know, a really well-refined recruitment process, but sometimes when you're dealing with that many people, it's hard work. But having the board makes it easy to see if there's any bottlenecks. Um, I don't think I actually finished explaining the board to you, did I? So this column is for when they've come in and they've applied, reviewed, on hold, test. We send everyone an online test. Um, it's first interview, tech interview, final interview, offer, no, which sounds really like angry with capital letters on there, um, and then hide from the right. So we can clearly see if there's any bottlenecks in this. If there's a load of people stuck in tech interview or we'll, you know we speak to whoever's doing that tech interview and say hey like you know what's going on or we can also see if we've suddenly had an influx of um say purple pearl developers we wish right um but if they'd all come in like oh, okay something we've done really worked well there let's let's analyze what we've done and try and replicate that with the other roles or if we're like oh gosh we haven't had a single python applicant in Right, let's look at that. Let's you know, stop what we're doing and analyze the work that's happening and see how we can improve that and get some people through. But it's not all just about boards and post-its. What else is important? Retrospectives. I can't stress how important these are. You know, you discuss what went well. Looking just like that in our office, that's how excited we get. And what didn't go so well? You know, what can be improved? In Scrum, these retrospectives would normally happen at the end of a sprint. But as I said, we can't really work in sprints in the same way. So we do these retrospectives maybe at the end of the campaign or, or maybe in the middle of the campaign when it's needed. But having the visibility of everything that's happening, what's going on, means you can see the point of time when you need a retrospective and just have one then. Team is really important. I can't underestimate how important the team is. A functional team is a key part of being agile. When I first came to Headforwards, I kept worklesser and personalesser really separate. It's like, I'm being professional. They don't need to know I'm weird. Let's, let's keep them two separate. Um, you know, I'd still like, talk to people and have lunch with people and go to the socials, and we had so many socials. Every month we're playing laser tag or bowling or barbecuing. And I'd still go and meet people, and it was lovely. But then something happened. A friend of mine joined my team when we merged with another company, and she's been a best friend for many, many years. And she just wouldn't let me do it. She wouldn't let me be work with her, and just grew out the crazy <laughs> in the wood. And now, you know, I'm just a weird dork at work, but I prefer it. I've made some really great relationships with my friends and my team. Um, you know, we know personal things about each other, and that's OK. I didn't think it was, but it actually really is okay. <laughs> um, it helps build the trust that you need to be, you know, to perform well. Um, being vulnerable can increase the team potential. And that's, that's important to know and learn, and it might be difficult for some of us when you try and keep closed off, but it's something to think about. You know, another part of being of our team is that we all have autonomy. So everyone knows what autonomy is, don't they? And that's a really important thing, empowering people to make their own decisions and do their work and, and get on with it. That also really helps. There's no hierarchy. It's a linear structure. Everyone's trusted and empowered to, to do what they want to do or what's right, do the right thing, should I say, not what they want to do. Um, and that helps the team succeed. Transparency is also really, really important. 
um, a lack of transparency can force an Agile project to fail. We try to be completely transparent at headboards, um, but we accept that we as a team have limitations. There are no hidden priorities, no hidden work. Everyone knows exactly what is currently being worked on by the team and what will be delivered. You know, Scrum by nature keeps everything visible. And interestingly, it's not just me that thinks marketing needs to be agile, which is great for me to hear. <laughs> um, earlier on this year, I went to the Marketing B2B Tech Summit. Um, and Paul Taylor from IBM did a talk on why it's time to get agile. And it was great to hear other big tech companies like IBM and Microsoft talking about their journey to embrace and adopt Agile. Um, also a big focus point in this event was about how sales and marketing teams need to work together. And the sales team should take marketing people out on the road with them and they should all sit together because that's how you grow a business and expand it. And having been someone that's always had a dual role of sales and marketing, I'm like, yes, you guys are catching up. This is the way to do it. Obviously, I'm sure IBM and Microsoft know how to do it, really, but I'd like to tell myself that they got it from me. So, does this sound good? Does it sound scary? You know, do you want to run and hide right now, or are you thinking about how you can implement this yourself? Dead silence, okay. Um, so, here are some things if you want to consider if you're thinking about Kraken Agile Marketing. If something is not working for you, change it. You know, think of the cuttlefish's ability to escape predators and attract prey. Or, you know, they can do it as quick as that by changing their colors to camouflage. Like, you should be that reactive as well. Try new things. Agile is not one size fits all. Um, and cliche alert, sorry guys. Agile is a journey, not a destination. It can be hard to get there, but make it happen. There's a story that I really love about an octopus in an aquarium. And by saying octopus there, I might have given away the ending. But I guess from the title of the talk, it's probably kind of obvious where I was going with it. Um, there was a tank, and fish kept going missing from it overnight, and they couldn't work out where they were going. And there was a security guard that would do walks around the aquarium at night, and they still couldn't find where these fish were going. So they decided to set up CCTV cameras to catch this mysterious nighttime fish capture. And what they found was the octopus was escaping from its enclosure, scuttling across, I don't know if they scuttle, but eating the fish and getting back to his own enclosure without anyone noticing. He was timing that so he'd miss the security guard during his rounds. How freaking clever is that? <laughs> And I'm so happy, and I want to come talk to you about that more afterwards. Because <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories. Um, that's so cool. Sorry. <laughs> right. It's like uh, when you meet a celebrity, isn't it? Um, so another issue to combat is reluctancy. How do you combat reluctancy? I don't want to do that. Um, so pace, pace, lead is an NLP technique. Um, sometimes people are reluctant because they're skeptical. You can solve this by showing them how it really works. And, you know, eventually they will come on board. You can make them feel part of the team, like really part of the team. Show them your vulnerability. Um, and when they really feel part of the team, they're not going to want to let the team down. They're not going to want to let you down. Confront the resistance. Not in a you know, Star Trek resistance is futile way, you know, but look at the team member as a person to be understood rather than a problem to be solved. I think that's a really important thing because we can forget that when we're struggling. They're a person to be understood. And remember, it's okay to fail, <laughs> but fail fast. You know, NLP teaches us there's no failure, only feedback. And I love that. You know, when something goes wrong, be like, hey, how can I fix it? And that just reminds me of the keynote yesterday. Everyone ready? Fantastic. OK, no one did that with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to remember that later. <laughs> um, but yes, I love that there's no failure, any feedback. Learn from mistakes and improve any processes 
or ideas. Squids have an ink sac that they can release really rapidly, so they can escape from it wherever's going wrong. Now, I don't recommend you escape a bad meeting with a smoke bomb, but if something's going wrong, take action now. Fail fast. So what has been the hardest part of the Agile journey for me? MVP. As I mentioned before, I've got really high standards, I'm a perfectionist, and I want things to be right. So the idea of putting something out there in the world that's not quite ready was quite literally terrifying for me. <laughs> I, like, I can't do this. <laughs> um, but with a lot of work, I've gotten much better. For example, I might want to do a big, full blog post about this staff barbecue we had last night including photos and recipes and all kinds of things. But I got some more important work to do. <laughs> you know, I got some press releases to write or a game of laser tag to play. So what I can do <laughs> um, is instead just do a short social media post, like two sentences and a photo. And it's not going to have the same impact, but it's good enough. Now. Other people's version of MVP can sometimes be wrong. MVP doesn't mean sloppy, half-finished work. And I think that's where I really struggled with it as well. Um, I see a, people lot, a lot of people cite things of, hey, it's just an MVP, but there's spelling mistakes, and there's no capital letters, or punctuation. I'm like, that's not an MVP. That's just rubbish. <laughs> so the Agile Manifesto itself cites technical excellence and attention to detail as the groundwork for speed. So get it right still. <laughs> um, are you all aware of the Agile Manifesto? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a lovely diagram that I got my colleague Jake to whip up for you all. So MVP is not this, just doing a little bit across the bottom. It's doing a bit of everything, making it feasible, valuable, useful, and delightful. How good does that sound? Sounds like something we'd want to put out into the world, doesn't it? So I came across this version of the marketing manifesto, like the Agile marketing manifesto. So please bear with me. Responding to change over following a plan. That makes sense. Rapid iterations over big bang campaigns. OK, yeah, yeah. So let's do small little things and see how they work, rather than going spending six months marketing budget on this big TV ad, which everyone actually hates, and then we get really negative press calls. Let's do some smaller little things, maybe some targeted advertising. Testing and data over opinions and conventions. So I've mentioned the previous company I worked at, and we made off-grid portable wood-burning stoves. So it was all like bushmen and outdoorsmen and you know wild men. And I was, so that's who we were planning to market it to. But I was like, hey, how about glamping? And that's a completely different kind of user. That is typically, if we're going to stereotype, the type of user, middle-aged woman with a university degree with two kids, probably doesn't work anymore. Those are the real narrow stereotypes. Sorry, guys, but we do that in marketing sometimes. So marketing this product in a slightly different way to them really boosted our sales and helped us get more mainstream for the same product. So let's not go over our opinions and conventions. If they're not going to want to be out in the woods, let's look at actually testing it you know, doing a small marketing campaign and, and reaching out to some of them through a magazine and then seeing what happens and going forward from there. Many small experiments over a few large sets. And individuals and interactions over one size fits all. Totally contradicting what I just said then about stereotyping people for advertising, but this is right, you know. Collaboration over silos and hierarchy exactly how we run our team. We work together, we work together with other teams, we work together with other clients and networks, Software Cornwall. Software Cornwall is a great example of that. I, is everyone aware of Software Cornwall? Yeah. Cool. So it's a not-for-profit organization made up with lots of different tech and software com companies in Cornwall. And we all work together to promote the industry and help uh, people realize that it's a great place to work and do business. And due to the work we've been doing, we've been ranked in the top five tech clusters in the UK for the last two years running. And we're the only place to be in there for two years, so come on right out, guys. Um, so, did you know, another little fact she's wanted in here, 
that the word kraken is taken from Norwegian. Um, and it means an unhealthy animal or something twisted. See why I like it. <laughs> and in modern German, crake means octopus, but it can also mean kraken. So the sailors would see the sea gurgling and surfacing fish and a plethora of jellyfish, and they'd know that something was up down below. So whilst fleeing the sea life always preceded the kraken's approach, it didn't give the sailors enough time to escape. So ultimately, if they saw that, they were doomed. The monster's great size and many tentacles made it uh, difficult to evade. So what's my advice? Be the kraken, not the sailor. <laughs> so what are the key points I would like you to take away from my talk today? I mean, cephalopods are awesome and very agile creatures, and I could literally watch this, this gif from SpongeBob SquarePants all day. I find it really oddly mesmerizing and relaxing. I can't even remember what episode it's from, but I just love it. It's mad, completely mad. But on a serious note, what do I want you to take away from this? Get organized, put up a board, have stands up with your team, you know, really think about what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve and where you're going. Have retrospectives. Look at what you've done. Has it worked? Could it work better? How could you do it differently? Be a team. Super, super important. You know, this takes work. It really does, but the payoff is incredible. Take the time to be a proper team. Be transparent. Be honest with yourself, with your team, with your clients. And that can be a scary step to take, being completely transparent with your clients, but I promise you they'll respond to it and you'll have a better relationship with them from it, which is better for business. And they react. If something's not working, change it. If it's working well, push it further. If someone's not responding, confront it. Not in an aggressive way, but raise it there and then rather than waiting and letting it fester. Address issues. <laughs> kind of just covered it, but you know, address any reluctancy in your team. And fail, but fail fast. Refine the MVP. Remember, it doesn't mean sloppy work. It really doesn't. And finally, you know, enjoy it. It is a rewarding and dynamic way to function as a team and see quick results. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? I think there's enough time. Yes. Every day we're on the board doing our stand up, so that's when we move the cards. So you move it into done or, or change the priorities. <coughs> you can also change the priorities when you do a backlog review. And if I'm honest, we don't do it enough because we're stuck in that doing cycle. We're doing the stand-ups, but we need to do backlog reviews more often. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. It depends on your backlog, really. Is it? Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Interesting. No. We were for a while, we were keeping them, but then we just had like, boxes full of post-its, so that was a bit weird, because we never looked at them. <laughs> it is a benefit of using Trello or something. Yeah, there is that. Um, it's a very valid point. I like to be able to have that data to look back at, but at the moment we don't have a, a function for that. Was there one behind as well? Because the jellyfish told me, I don't know. <laughs> See, it's a very, very valid point. I know I mentioned earlier that I was doing stand-ups on my own initially, um, and then I changed from the physical board to Trello again, because I had some stuff on Trello and some stuff on there, and I thought I'd go straight to that. 
But then when new members of my team joined, we decided to go to a physical board, because when you're first starting out, actually, it's easier to get up and do it around something physically to get into it. Um, so, and for a little while, I had all my tasks on Trello and on there, and I was like, I'm just duplicating things, so I'm just going to stop Trello and go to the board with everybody else. And we talked about putting the backlog only on Trello, so it was easier to manage and reorganize and prioritize, but then there was the concern about having one thing on Trello and one thing in real, and then every time you move the Trello card through, you'd have to write it on a post-it and put it up, and it just seemed like duplication of effort. Um, so there's talk again of moving on to Trello, but then there's some people in, in the business that say, you know, keep it physical. So we're undecided at present. Is there anyone else? Oh, hello up there, sorry. Um, there's people upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess a prime example of that would be is Headstock, which is an end of summer festival that we organise, and actually we tend to have a separate trolley board for this because there's so many little tasks that have to happen for this one festival that we organise that we couldn't put them all up on that board because there's not enough space for it. Um, because we don't put an hour time on it either. You can't tell just from post-its how weighted they are in time. So um, my colleague um, have so many post-its in a day, but she says they're all quite smaller tasks, like looking after um, like HR issues and people in the team, whereas some of mine will be up and actually that's like 20 hours work on that one card. So um, planning the festival involves lots of smaller things. I've got to order the wristbands, I've got to get the generator, I've got to organize the toilet. So we tend to put that on a Trello board and just have one card on the other. Yeah. 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 Um, no, not on the, the physical board. We just write the date on the posters. <laughs> so um, when it's called pull through, we know that it's, it's more urgent. Um, that particularly for like deadlines for getting like papers submitted and things like that, just write the date on it and have to be vigilant. Whereas I know Trello, you can put alarms on things, which is great, but... Is there another question down here a second ago? Um, smaller than that sometimes. If I've got a really important email that I need to send and it's been waiting for ages, like, oh, I need to email that person today, or I need to send a file off, I'll do that. Um, not, as I say, there's a card up in our dailies column for general emails and checking them and doing them, but sometimes I don't need to do that right now, but it does need to happen. So if I don't do a card for it, it's not getting done. Um, <laughs> I rely solely on that now. So yeah, small tasks, big tasks. Sometimes tasks need to get broken down more. Um, when you realize you can't do it all in one go, so you might need to go, right, I need to do this part, and I'll do a different card for this part of it, and a different card for this part of it. OK. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And actually, all our development teams do that. They have Trello up on big screen TVs in their office with touch screens. Um, they work in real time with people in Japan, like one of our clients and things. So having that visual real time is, is important. Um, but yeah, we've discussed doing that, having a, a TV with a touch screen in our office. One more minute. Any final questions? biggest task I've put on the board. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got one task that's up at the minute that is rewrite every single bit of copy on the website. So that's massive. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the ones I should break down into rewrite this page and rewrite this page and rewrite this page. But at the minute, I'm not ready to do that. I haven't, it's not as high priority as other things, so it's more of a place card, a placeholder card, so I don't forget that I really should be doing that. Um, Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. You've been great.